Archeo Death. Death and Memory, Past and Present, with Professor Howard Williams. Welcome, everybody, to another Archeo Death interview. And I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Tad Sturmer all the way from the other side of the pond. And we're going to be discussing all things digital public history and maybe a little bit of archaeology will slip in by accident but it's going to be mainly about digital public history today so welcome tad would you perhaps give you give yourself a more uh, eloquent and formal introduction to who you are and what your take is on all these digital public history matters uh, i can certainly make it more formal i can't make i can't make it more eloquent my uh, <laughs> i am technically i am a lecturer at uh, at johns hopkins university um, where i teach public history and public history practice i'm also the film and digital media editor for the public historian which is the journal of record for the field of public history at least in the united states it is um and uh, that is a new position so it's kind of uh, timely that we're doing this it's a new position created by uh by the uh by the journal and by the the governing body of the field, which is the National Council on Public History, um, to address the importance, the increasing importance, and even centrality of digital media and visual storytelling to uh, to the to the practice of public history. Uh, so uh, it is getting into the middle, into the meat of how people are actually engaging the past with the present through digital media, um, uh, and how. Um, uh, how we can center that in in ways that that uh, that you've addressed a lot, um, and that in in very profitable ways. Because if we have allied fields in public yes. history and public archaeology, yes. that um, that uh, that it is, and let's just say at best, it's an inchoate field, um, yes. an inchoate practice. Um, but we need to quickly, I think, um, come up with a level of parameters for how we deal with this, both from the outside in and the inside out. But anyway, that is that's my that's my current situation. Um, uh, I have uh, I have I have a PhD in history, and uh, I have taught at places, and I've been at places, so I'm not to sort of log into those kind of things. But um, uh, link in the bio. <laughs> yes, exactly. And there will be. There you go. <laughs> you know, and, and perhaps my over informal introduction is because I'm so used to interacting with Tad via TikTok and yeah. another one of now a series of uh, my my TikTok mutuals who I've, I've bullied on to coming on my my YouTube channel. And it's a real it's a real pleasure to and a privilege to know you and to hear your takes on various things that, you know, are not only fields of history I, I know scant about or nothing about, ah. but also, you know, the, the, the seeing the shared challenges that we face with the kind of rhetorics and pernicious misinformation out there the patriotic the the delusional and everything in between and and beyond <laughs> um i but mean, you know, so, it, I mean it, yeah Go i on. know it is interesting to see because i mean i learned so much from you about about you know not not just burial rituals but i learned so much from you about vikings and about these about these subjects and it it just so happens that our you know, it's it's interesting that when people think about, well, you're a public archaeologist, you're a public historian, that that kind of is, of is the main thing to do when really we we straddle these fields of academic archaeology and academic history and and the public um, side of what it is that we do. But it just so happens that our academic sides are both in areas that are high on the list of those that are misused that are that are abused that are high on the the disinformation priority list for people who want to twist it for their own ends whether that's for particularly when it comes to modern politics and sort of identity politics that when you're talking about the vikings or when you're talking about the american revolution the patriots these are these have both been weaponized in ways that i think that probably if you're a historian of the tutors um it's yeah. it's it's yeah, not yeah. quite the same Yes, I'm, I'm sure every period has its list of top misinformations and myth myth busting needs to be done. But yeah, there are certain hot spots, shall we say? And I do feel yeah. that you know, um, for a long time, early medieval studies, including history, archaeology, literature, and language scholars, have sort of sort of sleepwalked into a long. No, it should have hardly been surprised. I mean, this misuse and extreme misappropriation has been around for as long as the discipline, if not before. But but there has been a tendency to kind of say, oh, that's not my problem. And I, I must admit, I've been party to that for most of my career. I mean, I've dabbled in it as a sideline, but I've never you know, had the time or energy to tackle some of these issues you know, 
face on, but TikTok has, um, has been a learning curve for me and uh, a challenge for me because I realize some of the narratives that I'm trying to spin just don't work. You said that, that no one's mm-hmm. going to get what I'm talking about and I've got to sort of start from scratch and pivot and, and, and readapt. But, you know, yeah, the 18th century is, is a minefield for it. I mean, mm-hmm. it seems to be from watching your videos. I mean, tell, tell me about some of the examples, because, I mean, a lot <laughs> of that was I mean, some of it was vaguely familiar, but I mean, give it hit us with some of the top horrors that you have to face on social media with misinformation. <laughs> Um, here's the problem. And it's a problem that, that, that public history has helped me as an academic historian by helping me understand the, by understand the problem, um, that when we are, and it's as true in, in your field as it is in mine, that, that we have historiographies, we have, uh, we have bodies of scholarship that we, that we tend to deal with that shape the broader narrative from the academic end and that we hope filters down into um, other kinds of broader educational sources, whether it's primary and secondary education or whether it's or whether it's a more public sort of education. Um, the, the problem that we have uh, that we are increasing, increasingly seeing is that that historiography that has shaped the broader American history narrative um, is itself pseudo history is yeah. itself has been so it, there, there is always an element of nationalism in these kind of narratives oh, yeah. always mm-hmm. um however it has been so aggressively nationalistic as to be unrecognizable from a historical standpoint mm-hmm. um and because uh there have been um and the, the, and the best commentators on this frankly are are british scholars um who look at uh and particularly when i'm sort of re- looking at reviews of of works um on American history by British scholars, you you get the most the most kind of incisive uh, yeah. uh, perspective, which is this very unique um, this y- unique almost pernicious character of American academics that is highly performative that you have to accord to this nationalist narrative in order to get a job in order to keep a job in order to get tenure in order to be published in order to be considered to be part of the club and so what we're seeing because we in public history we are dealing with people who are not part of that club who are coming at this from different directions they are asking different questions and therefore they're they're requiring different approaches to answering them and in doing that it's a, it's requiring us to reevaluate even the value of the of the of the scholarly historiography um, that it's based on, and making us think, making us co- in coming at it from a different direction, it makes us reconsider me- reconsider its validity and therefore challenge it because our audiences are challenging it, mm-hmm. and if our audiences are challenging it, and we know that they're coming from for the most part, we can talk about those who are not, um, but for the most part, those who are coming at it in good faith because they want to understand the relationship between then and now, they want to. Get it right hmm. um that uh that we then have to start asking new questions and that even sparks new research and new ways of uh of interpreting both the evidence but also in, in being much much more critical of the uh of the of the academic approach to that evidence and frankly um it is um, the the the, the 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 scholarship team is not winning. Um, it's it's not it's it's not looking good for him at, at this point. When it comes to that point, where most people now we know in with digital media and 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 you know this so well, um, most people get their understanding of the past now, um, and we've got data to back this up through through digital media, right, and through hmm. visual stories. Yeah, absolutely, they're not getting it through academic articles. They're not getting it through books. Um, uh, and they're getting it this way, and um, which means that they're also coming at it from a much different perspective. And we have to kind of respect that and see that as being our core audience instead of the kind of folks who I used to. Um, obviously, I take my job very seriously. I love my students at Johns Hopkins. I'm not. Uh, I'm not saying that, but we being an academic historian or, or an academic public historian often means that you see your key audience as being the 15 students I have in my graduate seminar, yeah. right? I mean, that that's, and, yeah, yeah. and my, co- and my colleagues. Um, well, the minute that you enter into the kind of stuff that we're experiencing on TikTok and that we're experiencing broadly speaking in digital media engagement, whether that's on YouTube, like you have your, like you have so many great materials, um, that you are then stepping outside of that world and not into a disaggregated amorphous public, but what you are stepping into are a number of overlapping identifiable audiences. 
um, that that have to be understood um, because they have to be uh, because because that's the only way you can engage with them fairly, um, and that that poses uh, that poses some considerable challenges. I mean, I, I think your point about just circling back to your point about British scholars being able to do it better is not because we're such brilliant scholars. It's because we're outside of that particular system and structure. And yeah. I, I must I must echo that some of the conferences and dialogues with, say, Irish scholars, Irish archaeologists, Scandinavian archaeologists, German, French archaeologists, for me, have I'm not necessarily agreed with them. But it really puts you on the back foot when you realise a lot of your, you know, your echo chamber of your, you know, your British archaeology background or whatever it may be is suddenly being challenged by people who just don't buy in to the premises that you're you've been working with and you think oh i thought i mm -hmm. i'd healthily deconstructed my own problems and then you realize mm -hmm. oh no i haven't i haven't because look, look at yeah. all these scholars rolling their eyes at my use of a particular term or my particular spin on a source or whatever it may be and it, yeah it's it's really that, I mean, that's a healthy thing i suppose but it's always an unsettling thing in a sometimes a good way sometimes a really horrible way but you know it's but it's, the self but the self-realization that comes with that—I mean, that you're, yeah. you, the, the the term echo chamber is absolutely the the as absolutely the right one. Yeah. That you just are you all you're hearing is what's being reflected at you, um, and which creates its own its own kind of artificial paradigm. Yeah. And when you get when you run into people who question that paradigm yeah. just as fundamentally, uh, yeah. and you're like, oh wait a minute, okay. Um, that's been wrong <laughs> so all of that work can go on but then you're like okay well if i can like look at this from fresh eyes that are kind of it's it's like the discussion that we have about checking your biases right you yeah, know, by, yeah. just just in your own research yeah. and when you realize that maybe you have been walking around with wa yeah. walking around inside one big bias that you've got to find fight your way out of and in doing that you're alienating the people who are still in the echo chamber yeah. And so you're yeah. like, okay, I am doing my best to and try to understand this material, on the, the past on its own terms. I am doing my best to be part of a global community of scholars who are dealing with yeah. in their own terms. But in doing that, I am running counter and will pay the price for it. We're running counter to the predominant to that paradigm which controls in uh, in in my original space. And that, that is another one of these consequences of digital media engagement is that we can, we can, on one level, we can engage, we used to be able to, we used to, at least I would only engage with scholars of other, let's just say traditions when I would go to conferences, right? Um, uh, so if I'd go to Ireland or if I'd go to Scotland or if I go to England, sort of to talk about the American Revolution or the 18th century at large or public history, that's the only time I would engage with them. Now I can talk to you every single day. Yeah. Um, I can hear your take on scholarship every single day coming out of a different tradition. We can, we can hear from Frederick every yeah. single day yes. on a different tradition. And, um, and that to me has been just as transformative to my approach to scholarship. Um, in terms of my identifying my scholarly community of helping me understand the intellectual frameworks that we apply to our approaches, our methodologies and things like that, um, as engaging with the public is engaging with you. Um, I, that just sort of, I, I just think that's that's wonderful. It's changed but it's, the dialogue, hasn't it, with between yeah, academics and with audiences. Mm -hmm. for, for people to, um, who may not know, Frederick is a another TikToker who is a Swedish archaeologist, but also people on this channel will know I've just had a conversation with Alexandria Artifact and Professor oh, yeah. Meredith, who are also uh, public historians on TikTok. So it's I hope I get Frederick on soon as well. But uh, but you know, yes, exactly. Are it's changing the, the interaction between us as practitioners slash academics and the, the the various different audiences but i i mean the thing i've always found really striking about the british arts is not only we've got a million dialects but you know you the same talk i will have to pitch slightly differently between counties let alone villages ah. whereas perhaps i mean tell me if i'm wrong while there you have a obviously stark differences between say if you were talking to an audience of americans in texas versus maine you know there is at least a broader consensus of the where the myths lie or is that is it really mike is it down to individual geographical areas and, and and that you would you know the the different local versions of the say the uh, Amer um, american war of independence or the uh, civil war lie i mean i i'm just sort of pitching a, a thought about how we tackle the local in the in a digital in a digital space you know in those different localized mythologies 
Yeah, that that does make sense, but it ha it applies in different ways here. That okay. that depending upon the subject, right? When you get into because there are regional, uh, there are there are regional aspects of it that have to be t that 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 impact how people approach it, particularly when we're talking about something like the Civil War, um, and the 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 the. the the descendants of the northern states, the descendants of the southern states, obviously. I mean, these these have worked into identity in strikingly different ways. And then you, what you might have are the, for lack of a better term, the new states, um, the western states uh, come at it because it doesn't fit into their identity quite so much. So the Civil War, for example, doesn't really fit into identity formation in the American Northeast, but it heavily fits into the identity formation in the American Southeast. Um, and it uh, doesn't really fit into American identity formation in the West. The American Revolution um, and the founding period tends to be flatter um, in terms yeah. of uh, interpretation. However, um, in the again in the areas that were that are the oldest they tend to have um more of a historical landscape that is that speaks to them so they will have a local museum they will have their local monuments they will have their local patriot and so there might be there might be a a kind of a localized a kind of an inflection but in terms of the broader interpretation um, it doesn't. It doesn't really. It, it doesn't really matter quite as much if you're talking to somebody from Minnesota, or if you're talking to somebody from Arizona, or or if you're talking to somebody from Florida. There, there is just going to be the the nature and scope of the of the public education system. Um, but in the end, because the the because um, American textbook companies um, basically have a stranglehold on all uh, on all primary education that they are pretty much getting you know on, they're pretty much getting the same they're pretty much getting the same story and then because that's reinforced by a fairly I don't want to so I don't want to say it's coherent I think that's probably giving it a bit more bit more credit than it's due um, but that uh, this pervasive cultural um, uh, this cultural media uh, narrative that that is kind of imposed upon them a kind of where they get their information that they they tend to just kind of get this top line this very shallow approach to what it is and but it's wrong yeah and so when you get into it what they what they know is they'll know the the superheroes they'll know george washington and benjamin franklin and john adams and thomas jefferson and they will they might know oh my gosh there's this conflict between and america's i hate this term is america's original sin of slavery and that didn't live up to their that didn't live up to their to their high aspirations and they, they might get that yeah. um but for the most part when you're talking to people is that the minute that you say george washington isn't who you think he was um because i'll know who he is um uh, or Thomas Jefferson, that that you're like, okay, there's there is an entire historical world out there that you have never been presented. Why? Because it has never been in the national interest, um, and I I mean that pointedly. It has never been in the national interest to in fact give you the whole story. Um, it's been in the national interest to shape aggressively, chauvinistically, yes. um, shape a narrative that you that you hold on to in order that help identify what it means for you to be an American. And that identity as an American stems from the American Revolution and what the what the country supposedly began as. But we see now um, be, because that is no different, really, depending upon what region you're in, we see the harm of that, um, regardless of where you live. Um, uh, and because we see the way that uh, it is so deeply weaponized in politics, even in the the, the I, I cannot watch the, the Republican presidential debates, but the um, but I know that they talked about uh, returning to the spirit of 76, 1776 last night in the debate. Um, and there is there is constant references to we need to return to the time of the Patriots. We need to return to Patriot values. We need to return to the 18th century. We need to return to the spirit of 76. And every and they're doing that in a way in which people are picking up on a, on these code words about um, what being even just the word, what being a patriot means. And it's uh, it's it's causing real harm because of the way it is now embedded itself in uh, in American politics. When you have a speaker of the House, our new speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, um, whose entire political philosophy 
Um, um, and he says this drives him every day, um, is based on, uh, it's not just a biblical interpretation of, uh, of, of, of the world. It is an idea that, um, that we need to return to 18th century values, that the reason why America has become in his, in his perspective, an amoral country, um, is because the democratic reforms of the 20th century took us away from the values of the patriots. Um, and all of the values of the patriots and the constitution itself um, is derived from the Bible. This man is second in line to the presidency. Um, and he gets now to apply this um, to the way he approaches um, legislation in, uh, in the House of Representatives. And it's entirely based upon a misuse of uh, the of the history however it's not in a way in which a lot of people are going to stand up and say that's not right what they what what will get them a little bit is well i thought that america was not based on religion um that isn't that what the isn't that what the bill of rights is for isn't that what the first amendment is for isn't isn't the separation of church and state does that filter down into broadly speaking our civics education enough for people to understand exactly what that means and why that's the case and uh and uh but still that is that will end up being somewhat more regionally tinged um if you are talking to people from the south because a lot of uh a lot of folks tend to be tend, tend to be more evangelical and tend to actually believe that that's true um and so you have to but you understand where those audiences are. You understand kind of what you're going to get. Um, and you know who will engage with you in a conversation and what you need to do about it, what you need to do about it on a broader scale, sort of like the kind of things that I'm, that is working more and more into not only my work at the journal and my work within the field, but you know also my teaching is how do you go ahead and prep students, prep uh, future public historians, prep, uh, prep future public archaeologists, prep, prep future sort of cultural heritage specialists to engage on this level because that is um, tough, because it? they it, it's 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 tough but it's absolutely necessary. But how do you do it when you're starting from nothing? Well, this is the question I have because I mean I must say for people who are not familiar with your TikTok, is you're incredibly constructive about not simply saying this is this is horse manure, this is this is rubbish, this <laughs> is this, but you also do lots of videos where you're saying oh, this is a really interesting strategy of engaging us with the storytelling about this, and here's another way in which a TikToker or a YouTuber or a digital film is doing Y or you know, and you're giving us examples of how we can tackle this and i suppose the challenge for me um and maybe this isn't the way you think of it and i'd like to hear your views is when do we shout no no absolutely not and when do we go yeah george washington great guy but did you know this you know like we do that gentle game playing of you know how do how do we how do we do that you know when we're dealing with such diverse audiences because some people need to hear a screaming I am an expert and you're freaking wrong and none of that is it actually happened and more and, and besides here's 88 things that actually we do know about the uh, and, and then yeah. other people need a I totally agree with you that John Adams guy you know wasn't he uh, that's just and a flag flying in the background but not a Welsh one obviously you know, but, <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know and, and then you go but did you happen to be aware that he also did or you know, I don't know. Do you see my point? When do we? When are we? Oh gentle, yeah. Gentle. When should we just go in guns, not metaphorically blazing? I in am, terms of combat. I am stuff. much more gentle now because of you, um, because of our <laughs> conversations about ethics and digital media practice. Oh, don't um, blame me. So it's I'm blaming you. I mean, it is. I used to. I used to do that, um, and because sometimes, I mean, and just pedagogically speaking, right? The quick, easy, fast. Yeah. God damn it, you're wrong. Um, uh, Dunk um, has a has its place, right? I mean, yeah, that I it has to be. Um, I you know I I always throw my mind back to what would I do if if this conversation is happening with me down in the well in a classroom and a student is saying this um, yeah. right in front of me. I always think about that, and there are some cases where I mean, being in the classroom, you're like, all right. This is, I can't do that. 
right? That that's, um, uh, there are only a few occasions over the course of what now 15, 16 years of teaching that I have, that I have done that where I've just kind of laughed at somebody and said, no. Um, and then, and then try to think about this is a teachable moment. Um, let's unpack this. Let's, let's first figure out how you got to be so eye-wateringly wrong. And then let's get you to a point in which you can come with me to understand how we get this right. Um, but it more and more, and this started with our conversations about, about ethics and digital media was, okay, okay, well, maybe um, the, there are times in which I will just record a video that is exactly what you're talking about, that I'm just like, shut up. Um, I've got, here is my CV, right? I'm going to yeah, do yeah, a CV yeah, yeah. No, dump no, no. on you and shut up um, and listen to what I'm telling you. I sure um, I have a lot of drafts that never get to get, they, get oh, out yeah. like that and yeah. uh, and more besides. But, you know, but, yeah. And so then I kind of step back. and I'm like, oh, no, my son's going to see this one day. <laughs> and maybe and I'm like, I can't I can't do that. Uh, and, and and my I am so lucky. I I mean, there are lots of ways in which I, I am a benefit of considerable privilege, right? Um, that we both are. Um, but I am so lucky that my university, um, knock on wood, um, um, loves me and supports me. And, and, you know, I have more followers than my university does um, <laughs> that they on TikTok. And uh, they they appreciate what I do. They follow what I do. They like what I do. Um, but I want to I want to make sure that I'm not pushing that. Um, at least, yeah. um, it doesn't, what I, what I want to be very careful of is making sure that I don't ameliorate my message, yeah. um, that my amelioration is entirely about my, is entirely about my presentation. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I, I think that there are, and I also t have stopped engaging, um, in with people who are, um, I wateringly wrong and yeah. who I, I, I have tried to do a better job at, uh, of discerning, um, uh, valuable opportunities to discuss. Now, now sometimes it's just, this is just what I want to talk about because I don't get a chance to, and I like it. So yeah, there's yeah. that. But, um, uh, but for the most part now, what I do as a part of trying to practice what I preach, uh, almost literally, right? And sort of like, okay, here's digital media practice. Here's what we, because I know my students, but future students, past students, current students watch this stuff. Is that, okay, let's, um, how, where is there the opportunity here to connect with that broader audiences and broad audience, broader audience in a way that's, that's productive. I mean, sometimes that, that has to be, um, sometimes that has to be strident, but I am, and, but all of those drafts, are still sitting on <laughs> still still sitting on my phone and there there will be times that I, I just that I just unleash that that you are very effective in uh, in in doing that right in which because you could also do it in a way that I simply don't have the talent to which is even when you are absolutely uh, and if you ought to really write some guidelines about this but I mean is you will take a um, I don't want to say a lighthearted approach, um, but you will take a creative approach um, to 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 countering those kind of things. What, whether that is a personal dig um, or a personal attack, um, or that's something somebody that's being blindingly wrong about a subject, that you you have this uh, you have this way of um, that I don't of being able to use the format. Um, in in much more creative ways to actually address that, whether that is through music, whether that is through sound effects, whether that is through you know, you're able to do that, and wow, you're able to I, do that with I, great I, effect. I steal a lot of ideas from students who are better at it than me on the app, or you know, take an Why idea. Why not? Yeah. You know. <laughs> um, you know, I. I don't do that. I, I press record and I talk and that's it. And if it doesn't make it into that, then it doesn't make it in. <laughs> Maybe when my son grows, gets older and I have more time, I can do that. But, 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 but because, and this is one of the cool things about digital media engagement, right? Is that um, it is, 
there are so many tools at your disposal in terms of the flexibility and, and opportunities just afforded by the format itself um, that you can just, you know what, I'm going to address this. I'm going to respond. I'm going to do it effectively in ways that my audience will understand, but I'm going to do it by um, through some animation and through some sound effects and through some and that's that's not nothing right i mean this is a this is a way to use the forum um the format to achieve your communications ends that doesn't have to be the traditional presentational way of doing it and i and i, and I and I appreciate that, and I think it's effective. It's not always having to be high tech, is it? And that's the other yeah, thing yeah. is that I mean, talking to camera for a two minute, three minute stint or four minutes, my um, some you know the fo- they've changed the format D- does still people are still watching it. You don't have to do strange dances and effects to you know yeah. to, you can. And I've seen just yeah. a couple of psychom communicators actually going into the dancing mood and sort of kind of a kind of beat poetry and all sorts of weird things to try and <laughs> turn. And I, I, I'm just going, well, this is this is this is a bit beyond me. But my point <laughs> is, you, 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 there, there are, it is you can simply just turn on your phone, record, and talk, and people are yeah. willing to go. Ah, here's someone who knows what they're talking about. Yeah. They're they're presenting some resources. Here's here's something that they can say. And you'll always come up against the 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 angry people, but there are a lot of people who are really hungry for this. And it is yeah. It, whether whether we like it or not, it's the only way we're going to be able to get across from many audiences is to be even a small presence on these these applications and trying to share something. So I I don't know. I mean, I suppose. I suppose one thing I wanted to ask you, and we we are kind of running out of time on, um, so I might edit this, and uh, I don't know, I don't know what happens when we run out of time. I've got three minutes left. I probably have. So what do we do? Oh, do we? Should, I think we have a ten minutes, and then we can rejoin the link. Would, would you have time for? Uh, that? I think we can. Pr- I think we can. Pr- yeah, we absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you bet. Is that all right? But yeah. I mean, one thing I was going to ask, and maybe if we just if if I disappear, it's because it's run out of time. But I'm going to talk about you know we are th- challenged. Authority is being challenged on these media, and that can be a very unsettling and ups- a frustrating thing when people go, "Well, you do just want to go." I mean, I have people say, "You're just lying. You're not a professor," you know. And but but sometimes that's quite healthy that people are not going to just buy it because I'm say I'm a white guy with a British accent sounding a bit like a sort of cheap version of Jeremy Irons going yeah you must you must you must listen to my authoritative take on this you know I think it's good that people are going bullshit you know what about this you know and I don't mind that sometimes sometimes it's irksome but you know but I mean what's your take on this authority situation with digital media and, and public history Do, is it healthy or is it a problem that people just won't believe anything anyone says I mean uh, well there's there are two parts to that I'll see if we can get it into the two minutes and sort of come back to it but the, the, I think there are two parts of it there are those who um, are simply I don't want to say that we're, well, of course we're elites. I mean, we're elites in the sense of our education and stuff like that, 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 uh, who are simply anti elitists. And, uh, so the folks who will like uh, come on to my comments that I just delete them. Like yesterday I had a guy come out and says, well, obviously, um, you're, you're, you're wrong. Um, you went to, you went to Harvard. So, uh, so obviously you're wrong. And I'm like, <laughs> you went to Harvard, so I mean, you're wrong. <laughs> really? I mean, that's, I mean, that's it. Right. I mean, somebody's like, Oh yeah, your Harvard shirt means that you're an idiot. I'm like, Okay, that's that's not a constructive point of departure. Um, where I do think it's healthy, and, and that those I just don't respond to. I'm like, there's no. I just, I even just delete them. I think that delete the delete button um, is is very healthy for mental for mental health and for public discourse. But where I think it's really valuable is in the um, show you work. Um, how do I know that you know yes. what you're talking about? Yes. And I think that having to go ahead and back that up. Um, having to go ahead and and present that and represent that, I think it's absolutely healthy because it requires us to do it ourselves. I go, well, wait a second. How do I know that? Is it because I ha- I am just picking up this secondary work um, at, that I have read uh, that I know is good? Um, but oh, but is that is that it? Have I actually seen the primary sources? Is this part of my work, or am I just at another level of what the person you're having the conversation with can do too? Um, and there's an opportunity there to say, here, here's how we know what we know. And I think that is not just healthy. I think that that is, I think that's an essential part of it. Um, and I, what I, what I like about that though, is that it doesn't matter how many letters you have after your last name, yeah. that we all have to kind of be willing and okay with kind of showing our work in that. And so that kind of, um, challenge to authority, I think is 
absolutely healthy and even refreshing for us too. Uh, that uh, that I, I was thinking about it sort of as, in a sports metaphor because I'm really I'm really really terrible at metaphors, but uh, <laughs> but that that we're we're supposed to, in terms of digital media engagement and public history and public archaeology that we that we're still trying to figure out the rules we're still trying to figure out the ethics um except we have uh, opponents who will uh throw things at us from the stands um uh we have and we have like a team ownership that doesn't know how to play the game but they're expecting us to win um and they're not really giving us the equipment to to do any of that um it's <laughs> and there's no referee <laughs> and there's no referee um so I'm like, okay, all right, fine. Uh, it, it is difficult, isn't it? And and um, and and there's so many dynamics to it that uh, I still don't know what to do because at one level I'm a very small creator, mm. at one level I'm quite a big creator compared with other small creators. So like I'm, I'm starting to get people doing the tagging me in things, going, "Is yeah, this right?" Yeah. And and I'm going, and sometimes it's like if it's a loot, a metal detectorist or a looter, basically a treasure yeah. hunter account, yeah. I'm not going to respond because I don't want to bring, a, I don't want to be in that space talking yeah. to someone whose whole account is you can make money by rifling stuff they may do it responsibly because not all yeah. not all metal detectorists are bad but but it's it's that whole account is geared towards that so i don't respond to those but other places yeah. where it's a constructive but then sometimes it's just oh look here's a woman speaking Howard, can you confirm this woman knows what she's talking about? And you go, yeah. really? You know, you can work that out yourself. You don't need me to 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 um, to to comment. So you know, it's a difficult balance, isn't it, of yeah. knowing how to do that interaction. At one level, I have my stitches closed, other than mutuals, so I don't I don't want people stitching me all the time and going, here's a person because I can't, you know. We have to have our limits of where we put yeah. up our protective barriers because there's one thing about how do we engage, but also the strategies of engagement, but also there's the safety and the um, the abuse, which, as you said already, you know, we, sometimes it's just easier to delete stuff. You know, we're not obliged. Well, no one's paying us to respond to every comment within 30 seconds or uh, 10 minutes, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, and it can become exhausting. And, and there, are, I mean, there are really two two really important points that are in there. One is the, the one that you addressed in a post uh, just the other day um, that um, I think that you were, I think you are responding to Alexandria um, about sort of defensive engagement. And you and I have talked about this. I mean, you were so generous as to come and talk to my class about about, about your practice. Uh, uh, but is that um, uh, we, are, I don't want to say we, op we don't, we operate in different terms than somebody like Alexandria. Um, yes who not only can, but really should um, be absolutely protective about just their very identity. Yeah. Um, you, and, you and I are absolutely open books, yeah. right? That we, I mean, people know, um, you can know everything about me. Um, I'm, I'm a known quantity. I have, I've been around for a while. We are, we are in a sense, public figures. I yeah. mean, in a, um, that we, you know, the universities that we're at, the work that we've done. I mean, it's all, it, from LinkedIn to to uh, my university homepage to social media stuff is that to you know, being on TV or whatever that that we that we can't, we that's a, that is a a clock we can't unwind um, and and we and we shouldn't we've got uh, you know that's that we've achieved this level for you know whatever benefits of that's accrued but uh, but that we yeah. but we have to have other ways that will protect. Um, uh, not just protect our integrity, but but also protect our mental health because that's the way that we can in fact continue to be productive, um, and 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 that leads into the, um, and, and that's kind of like tactical, right? I mean, do you yeah. shut off these kind of DMs and do you shut off these kind of stitches? And so, um, and do you and what kind of choices do you make that will shape that will shape your engagement that will shape your online community? Um, and then the the other point though was really about um, how to how how to determine the the nature of your the nature of your engagement um, that 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 people will try to and you know I'm getting more and more of this too is that people will go ahead and try to use you against kind of other creators and that's yeah. I've seen that tag come up a lot and it's just like oh well I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna tag tag Ser tag tag server on this. Um, ooh. Yeah. Um, you know, don't, don't do that. Uh, but 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 if it's because I tend to, and this is just a matter of practicality. 
I find it impossible to keep up with. I, I find it possible, impossible to keep up with comments. And this is just um, uh, this is just me being a lazy bastard, right? I mean, I find it impossible to keep up with everything. No, you can't. Um, and you can't. so I feel so. I I in fact sometimes feel really bad about that that we have these communities, and I want to be responsive. Um, but there is no way that I can keep up with DMs, that I can keep up with tags, that I can keep up with. There's there's no way to, to curate that on, on my end. I can't even keep up with emails from my university, much less from my students, much, no, no. Less, much less from our community online. So I don't know how to do that. Um, and so I think that's good, though, because I am generally oblivious to what to what other people are doing. <laughs> my stuff. That is a healthy thing. I, uh, yeah. I, I mean, mean I, I care about I make sure I I follow I make sure that I keep up with the people who I follow, the people like you and sort of our our, our mutuals. But uh but other than that, it's just it, it is it it can be exhausting. Yes. I mean I, I had a bit of a shocking personal uh, moment today where I I saw a post from a mutual who I just happened to haven't seen their videos for a month for, because of the algorithm and various things. And yeah, there yeah. they are. They've lost their hair and they're in chemo. And you suddenly go, oh, God, uh, you know, why did I miss that? How did yeah. I miss that? And you sort of feel that sense of, yeah. I mean, I'm just, that's a very stark example, but I'm just yeah. using it to make the point that, you know, we can't, we're not in each other's business all the time. We, and I, I particularly yeah. with students online, I, I, while I may be mutuals with some of them, I try to give them their space because I don't want them to be associated oh, yeah. with, the, with the manure I spout and uh, yeah, necessarily, yeah, yeah. you know, and I want them to have the space that they, um, you know, they can build their own ideas without thinking I'm observing every post they do. You know? Yeah. Um, I, I'd love to know what your policy is about that because I don't, because my students are always, there are the digital media still freaks them out They're, they are i yes. think a younger cohort so they are more digital native so it doesn't quite freak them out but i don't i make it very clear to them it's even i built i'm building into the syllabus right that um that i there is no expectation whatsoever that you follow anything that i do Yo, um, yes my own students i don't have i don't set any expectation other than i i do uh, i do use tiktoks occasionally as educational tools so i set them i uh, set my public because we had a class um i was ill i was ill yesterday and i'm a bit poorly today uh, but i was supposed to be teaching my students about digital um about how to combat pseudo archaeology and i gave them two archaeo wolf i told them go find yeah, two yeah. archaeo wolf videos and look at the way he does it and we can discuss what works what what other issues yeah. with that kind of approach because he takes a very casual conversational and robust approach and um uh, but but then there's different ways of doing it so i was going to that that class is now postponed but my point is i occasionally use it in those contexts but no i don't expect individuals of my own students to but but i mean I'm, i was thinking of there's some some really great archae the biggest archaeology creators happen to be students at other uk and us institu higher education institutions but i i kind of um I, I, you know, I, I, I try to give them their space to do their things. They do, like you said, we have different rules that they're doing things that I wouldn't dare to do, or but then equally, mm -hmm. or wouldn't wouldn't feel comfortable doing. But you know, it's it's it's. So I just try. I don't have a a, a clear, you know, policy so much with that. But it's more about making sure that I don't. I'm not on their case with anything or going publicly. You're talking crap, you know. Because sometimes I go, oh, that's wrong, you know. But I don't want to be sort of. <laughs> I don't want to go sort of, you know. Well, it's maybe you know uh, I, try, I try to keep it a bit loose and relaxed but yeah sometimes i just I, I like i had one one creator recently i did send a dm to him and say hey by the way i don't think people will understand what you meant by this i'm sorry to say this but it's a la it was a language thing you know they you know i said yeah. you're, you're not a first language english and i don't want to be rude but you know that really doesn't make sense it wasn't disastrous it was just like people will think a completely different thing by using that adjectives <laughs> and they went oh right yeah you know <laughs> So I, just, I think that yeah. that's a really important point about that about uh, you know we we talk a lot about digital media ethics in terms of uh, in terms of engagement and one of them is about holding is about setting our own ethical guidelines sort of holding each other accountable to that and I am still not quite so sure where that is um, no. uh, like how to do that because there are plenty of people who and here's an example that there is a I I actually have a in my bonnet about people who 
claim authority that they don't earn. It drives me nuts because it because yeah. it, it, it enables because it just empowers them to be misleading and it's just it's just ego. And it's essentially people who are already privileged in a sense, who will then go that extra mile and say that that either they are um, that they have earned their authority in one field, uh, let's say, say biblical scholarship, um, and they're uh, but they're going to move in to talk about uh, they're going to talk about nineteenth century America. They're going to talk about American politics, talk about American history, and use that same authority. Or yeah. more recently, there was a, uh, a a creator who is a journalist. I love journalists. I'm married to a journalist. I get it. Um, uh, but and I followed him because uh, what's going on in Gaza absolutely needs more smart people talking in yeah. measured ways about what's really happening and what yeah. we you know its background. So and um, and he was doing that and but his background in journalism was in Haiti um, and so his uh, his understanding of what's going on in in Gaza comes from being you know a Jewish man and and sort of and uh, you know, understanding in a more personal level what's going on there um but he did a post in which he's, he was talking about the louisiana purchase um and because and it was in the context of of uh of a two-state system and land grabs and and um but he was talking about the louisiana purchase and uh, and i was like but then I, I it bothered me a little bit then but i could be bothered i'm okay i can go through life being bothered by things but at the very end he he it, and it was a dunk right it was one of those posts in which um you take the easy comment and you just want to go ahead and be absolutely smarter than the other person and show somebody how much smarter and better that you are and that i find that to be somewhat distasteful um from somebody like that right if if it's somebody who deserves it because they're being an asshole um then i'm fine with that um and then they tend to scurry away into their holes and they delete their posts so i'll delete my post but uh but this person at the end said um uh basically uh, this gets it back go into away our, and read uh, things uh, wasn't it or something like, yeah. well, it was go away and read things um and uh, before you question me a journalist and a historian and this gets back into our conversation about challenging authority um is that well wait a minute um there is no there are no circumstances that i can conceive of that anybody in good faith even if they're wrong um can't challenge what it is that i say right there is nothing i've ever done no school i have ever gone to no degree i've ever had that makes me completely immune um or beyond question none of it um and then he, but in adding that as a journalist and a historian, in order to improve his authority, but he's not a historian. Um, this, it's, it's like somebody writing a book on, on I write a book on, on Schliemann, um, but then they're going to call themselves an archaeologist. Now, this is an interesting point, and I want your mm. perspective on this, because archaeologists are very small, are much smaller in the states of course we're not even seen as a separate discipline in many universities we are anthropologists or mm -hmm. you know we're seen as a subsection of that the, the field archaeologists the cultural resource management archaeologists or state archaeologists will be archaeologists but mm -hmm. a lot of archaeologists are subsumed so there's a lot of inferiority complex that archaeologists have and we do feel set upon that few people feel they are experts in our field when they mm -hmm. wouldn't question a car mechanic or a brain surgeon but they're happy to lean in but i have a sense and this is something for you to disagree with or not i don't know i have a sense that the term historian is even more exploited that almost anyone can go in fact i've thought yeah. about doing this as a parody thing because as an in joke i have with a couple of my historians in my in my department because i'm in the department of history and archaeology and uh, i've been on tv one of the, the few times i've appeared on tv they put the caption howard williams historian and then i got these text messages <laughs> you know <laughs> my point yeah. is i I've, i was going to do this as a parody howard williams a historian you know and is that true do you think that history historian as a title is even more exploited than yeah. anything yeah um, I, I won't i i it is such an um it is so, such an amorphous storm i think that 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 easily exploited is the is the way to put it because it is just generally seen people it's generally just seen as knowing about the past and that's um and 
collecting facts, right? I mean, it's yeah. it's it, what we would consider being an antiquarian, um, people seen as being a historian, um, that it doesn't really come with the come with the, the, I don't want to say baggage, but come with the, uh, the structure of, we need to understand context. There's, there's research methodology. There's yes. uh, there is a process by which somebody comes a historian. And I try to stress on in digital media, I stress to my students that that's not a matter of, it's not necessarily a matter of education of letters after your name, although that helps yes. not a necessarily a matter of the, the schools that you attend, although that helps. Um, but it is an appreciation of the process of the skill set of, uh, of of that that makes you a historian, not just somebody who will go and write a blog post about the past. And they like and they like doing that. Um, that that you can abuse it so quickly and so easily, yes. and not and you can be a and and I, and I see this in archaeology a lot too. You can be an amateur historian you can oh, be an amateur okay, archaeologist that, and that as long as you're honest about uh, as long as you're honest about it Bill, there are a lot of people who will then just use that to cover the fact that they just go around with a metal detector and a shovel um and take the same kind of approach to history that they will just talk about they will just essentially dig out some facts um and they will share it and all of a sudden they are a mm -hmm. historian without the uh without really understanding um why it matters um uh, to to be uh to be a historian um and that's i mean that's a huge problem i was asked and i'm gonna I'll probably post about this today um uh i was i i because i have to review all of these things uh for the for the journal i have to review you know all kinds of different things um i was asked about uh does somebody who made a um to somebody who made a uh, a documentary recently about George Washington, um, um, what what do I think about that as as history and and are is that filmmaker a historian? And um, and I think that that's a valuable conversation because it, in the end it is it you can talk about what um, being an historian isn't and and what it is um and you could also talk about sort of the dangers of, of biography i've been getting into this more thing more recently where most american history is pseudo history and most of the the hero worship that passes for like biography is just fan fiction yeah, yeah. um and and you can actually understand it within that kind of popular cultural structure that that this is just fan fiction and there's a there's there are rules to this there's a genre there um but what that does is just get you further and further away from the truth whereas being being an historian that you you could be a historian and a filmmaker um uh if you are following following the rules and i think that the best public history is done sort of the visual storytelling um but with with this kind of stuff i think that it is uh important to be able to have those kind of object lessons that uh that for that people and i've learned more about this on on through public history um in when i first started in public history but it's certainly that's been turbocharged on TikTok, is to be able to almost empower members of your online community that they that they in fact can be historians um that what they're doing is in fact that they've been historians all along they've just never really known what to call it but if you are if you're engaging in that methodology if you have an appreciation of context if you if you're doing all of these things then then yeah you are not merely actually not merely a teacher you're not merely something else these are people who are like kind of downplaying their own work and saying no 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 you're 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 in you're in it's it's part of doing it um and that that's really what made me appreciate kind of different methodologies one of the things that i did that to me was one of the one of the most valuable things that i did in understanding the work of the historian was to spend a summer at an archaeology field school um, when I was in graduate school um, at, uh, at, at George Washington's Mount Vernon, uh, they were in, in ways that people who know me will will appreciate. They were they were dis they were excavating the distillery, George Washington's distillery. Um, so it, it had it, it was after my own heart in some ways. Um, but so I joined the archaeology field school for the summer so that I could get a hands on appreciation of the methodology. Um, I am I am not an archaeologist because I participated in a field school. Yeah. Um, uh, but I did, I, but I do think it was a healthy way to know how bad my knees were even then. 
um, that I still don't understand how to scrape um, with a trowel properly. Um, I'm always butchering the ground. Um, but how the that methodological that methodological approach to to archaeology and to field archaeology by understanding layers, understanding context in that sense, in that very physical sense, helped me so much as a historian um, to really shape kind of those 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 words. So that kind of interdisciplinary approach or maybe multidisciplinary approach um, really did really did help me. And that's the kind of thing I try to encourage through our online engagement encouraged through public history has been inherently an interdisciplinary and it's it's field. enabling isn't it because i mean what yeah. for the listeners i think it's important to re-emphasize that we're not saying and this is something we see snobbery within the discipline you're not a, you, being a real historian isn't isn't about translating a 14th century latin uh, manuscript being a real historian archaeologist isn't about knowing how to um half section a post hole and and recording yeah. contents those are just f- methods within a broader well techniques within a broader set of methodologies which sit within research questions context you know and 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 it's it's not actually being exclusive and gatekeeping to actually say you need to engage with those methods but once you're engaging with those approaches it's actually enabling it can actually as you say many people who have been doing it uh, i didn't know i was being an archaeologist well what you're doing is you've just surveyed all of the standing buildings from a small medieval um Mm -hmm. you know small english village you have done buildings archaeology but i didn't dig anything so what you know it's 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 it's, well you call it history call it architectural history call it buildings archaeology there's a difference but but you know in in in, from an vocational perspective you're engaging with your historic environment you're doing work you're making videos about your your local cemetery or your local the stories from your local hillside or wherever it is, uh, you know, that that is history. That is a form of public engagement, whether you disciplinary compartmentalize it or not. And that's what we want to enable and encourage, really, I feel. Um, it's dif- difficult to know how to do it. I mean, one thing I wanted to ask you about, and I don't know how you feel about this, is the one thing I've been very wary of, and I haven't articulated this, I don't think, to anyone before, so I don't know if you feel the same or disagree, is I don't want to get into a loop of my social media presence being countering other people mm. because I don't want to become some symbiotic on them and them on me. <laughs> you know, like, I, like I've seen some creators are just constantly debunking the same individuals again and again. Yeah. Someone yeah. says something nonsense about the Bible and then the same experts going um actually you or someone's saying something about the 18th century and there's 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 dr sturmer going no you know and and i feel i don't know how you feel about that but i i'm very wary about i'll do debunks occasionally but i don't want to be a presence of just negatively going that's wrong (laughs) i don't know what you feel about that you know no i think you're well it's a it's it is, I think, about how to be a productive member of a community, and um, and that it can't just be that has to. There's going to be a positive aspect of that as well as let's just say corrective aspects of that in order to be productive, right? Because we, in the end, we want we want to make sure that everybody. And this is kind of my philosophy to the extent that I can so so glowingly call it that. Uh, my philosophy is that I just want to make sure I'm being productive. Um, and that people are getting on the same page in terms of their knowledge so that they can then they can then be informed with whatever they want to do with it. Um, but we we need to go ahead and we need to correct some things, but that is part of community accountability, but we also need to add to it. I am very, but to do that, I am very, I try at least to be very, very um, uh, almost religious about my lanes. Um, I, yeah. I am, there are there's a lot of things I could talk about um, that I that I am interested in that I know a lot about, um, but I don't. Um, and I try to make it very clear when I don't know about something that that's 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 not my thing. I can give you the top line. I can go reach for the book. I can <clears throat> I can give you an informed opinion maybe. But there are a lot of people who can give you informed opinions about something. So what I what I try to do is be very clear about where uh about the the role that i think that i can play productively um that i can that i can actually contribute to because because it's it is that how do i know what i know um well if this is kind of in my lane in my background um i would uh 
you know, maybe if I had more time, I, I'd probably talk more about Doctor Who. Um, <laughs> um, I, I love, I love Doctor Who. It's great. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I just, I can't get enough of time. I am so excited about the new Doctor. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> but um, I didn't know. Did I know? Well, I, did, I don't think I knew that. I didn't know I knew no. you liked Doctor Who. Oh, God. I wore the I, scarf. I, yeah, no, I, I love the, I love the Tom Baker look. It, it works. Um, uh, you know, we could talk about that all day long. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful approach to history. It's a wonderful. Yeah, it I think, gets I don't, people I thinking, doesn't it? It's good stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I can't. I can't wait for the new Doctor. Uh, but uh, it's it's uh, the new. I can't. The, the Russell T. Davis coming back. It's just. I. Just, I. I'm so excited. Um, <laughs> but uh, but in any case, um, the. Uh, getting back to what we were talking about, I'm just very careful about my lanes. But what I try to do, um, because I don't. Um, I, I want to, I, I try to, this is going to sound really arrogant and maybe that's because it is. I, I really try to model what I hope that I'm reflecting to my students about constructive engagement, um, about seeing, um, where things that need to be corrected that I think are directly related to, you know, for example, what's going on in, in American political culture today. I mean, I think that that's a, you know, with Christian nationalism and things like that, I think that there's, that, 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 that that's got to have people who know what they're talking about saying, I'm saying anything because um, the, because the Academy isn't going to say anything about it. No. Um, because there is too ma- there are too many people who are too afraid of the politics, who are too afraid of the backlash, who won't say anything about it. Somebody's got to say something about it. So I am I am happy to be that guy. Okay. Um, uh, but on the other hand, is that there are ways in which I, uh, but only when it fits into the kind of stuff that I know about. Um, so I I really try to be careful about that. And even when we're talking about. I, there are things that I would love to talk about with my own research and with my own work. Um, and that e- even in terms of like right now, my main, my main work is on stuff that I actually don't talk about. It's, it's really on, on the, 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 the emerging practice of, of visual storytelling and digital media as public history tools. And that includes TikTok, right? And you and I have talked about doing stuff for the journal and about other things. And, but that's not exactly the kind of thing that a lot of people will engage with on, uh, on TikTok or on, or on YouTube. Um, but I would love it if they did, um, that to be able to talk about how we're doing these things, but how, um, that kind of audience engagement um, has to be dealt with um, in a constructive way. There needs to be parameters. There needs to be guidelines. But that's what I'm spending most of my time doing and, and working on visual storytelling and helping students understand the power of putting together visual stories as a way of reaching their audiences. But I never, I don't really get a chance to talk about that much because I there, there doesn't seem to be much room for it. Um, and then my academic research is still on the loyalists and on the American Revolution, and I will slip that in every chance that I get. But I also know that I am, that's the kind of stuff that I'm really excited about, um, both in terms of my my public history practice work and in terms of my academic work. Um, but what I am, try, but I, what I try to be careful of, um, and maybe this is unnecessary, but what I try to be careful of is make, it's gonna sound dumb, I, I try not to make the channel about me. <laughs> you know, that's, that sounds stupid. Um, yeah. It's my channel. It's my name. Um, yeah, there are, but there are people and other issues. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are people who I've talked talked to said like, and I, that I've said I I am I'm a big movie fan. I'm a I'm a big I'm a big Norse mythology fan. This this is my Thor mug. Um, hey. um, uh, this is uh, where I'm Norwegian. My last name is Norwegian for bringer of storms. My son's name literally means bringer of ocean storms. Um, 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 uh, we are, you know, we're big MCU fans. We're big, you know, and, and so I have people saying, boy, would I love to hear your opinions on, on Marvel movies? I'm like, I, I can't, yeah, uh, but not, I, I see people do that. Right. And yeah. I, I know just, what you mean. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I just can't, um, I think that this is kind of my, this is my space. I don't want to make it about me. But we all have um, to have protective strategies like that. Or not, or not protective, yeah. but we. I mean, like, I could imagine you in a couple of years, maybe you'll set up a 
a Doctor Who strand, you know, and, a, and some people yeah, do this. They have, a way to do that, right? they have other whole different accounts, don't they? Doing yeah. someone like I just came across one historian. I didn't realize I had a completely different separate account where they dress up and do their cosplay, history cosplay. And, and I just went, oh, so you're a play, oh. a play doctor on another account, you yeah. know, doing, and that's fine. But, you know, it's really interesting the way that people do this. And, you know, but, but no, I think you're right to keep it about yeah. the things you feel comfortable because there's a distance. There's a little bit of a distance. Yeah. It's not just your thing. Yeah. And I just don't assume that people care, right? I mean that that I don't I don't try to talk about too much about me because I just don't want to assume that anybody cares about any any of that. Um, that uh, so, and, but the other thing that uh, that that what we do in digital media, in particular on TikTok, that has really shown me, and sort of you reminded me with the cosplay point, um, is seeing how the kind of valuable uh, productive content that people are creating. Um, in ways that I had never thought of before, like like cosplay, right? That I have taken cosplay so much more seriously as a way of storytelling. Now it could be now a lot of it's fantasy cosplay, I mean, it'd be Doctor Who and stuff like that. Um, um, uh, but seeing kind of the seriousness that that approaches, and therefore the the meaning that's put into that, um, yeah. that then. I take a look at like some public his some traditional public history practices like costume interpretation um, that they don't want to see as being cosplay, but it is cosplay. Yeah. Um, and if you want to do it right, you should do it like some of the best cosplayers do it. Um, they take the stuff seriously um, and they hold each other accountable. And that's impressive. Um, yeah, there are lessons that we can draw from all of these different ways of telling stories. And I just think that the people who are doing things like that, that you can, I mean, you can sort of gain so much more meaning out of Dr. Who with the, uh, with this, uh, yeah. with interpretation, but, but it can go wrong. Like with what both you and Frederick have talked about in terms of Viking cosplay. Um, it can go really, really, really wrong with that. Yes. Um, because then that becomes cultural appropriation. Then that needs to be called out. So it can also be a tool for how do we, how do we, how do we hold that accountable? Um, how do we hold exactly. that accountable? I think exactly. That's... And that's something that I, I think people don't understand about me on the Viking side of things, but or the Viking archaeology histories, I think, is that how I actually like content, like by Tank Tolman, who's doing it basically uh, weightlifting and fitness re regimes, putting on a fake uh, Ragnar Lothbrok accent from the, uh, and, and I don't see, there's, I see no problem with that. And he gets, he gets flack from people who think like pseudo intellectuals think that they've got an angle. Oh, you're, you're not real. You're not a real Viking. He, oh, he's yeah, obviously play acting. Kind of it, stuff, he's yeah. not trying to stereotype indigenous uh, yeah. facial uh, tattoos and face art, you know, facial, facial um, painting in, in a, you know, he's not doing that, you know, and people don't see the distinction. So people are saying, hang on, you're, you were last week, you were having a go at some, somebody for doing this, but then you're, happily engaging with these people i said because they're not they're not causing any real world present day harm by right. their playful and i think play is such an important part yeah. of what we should be doing that's what it should be about it should be fun um yeah that's just my take <laughs> no because because there's a celebratory aspect of it yeah right that yeah. that if and that if people are able to go ahead and pull out symbolic elements of it and, and that that can really mean something to them um is uh that that's that there's a real value in that but it's about because that leads you down to a discussion of meaning and the persistence of that meaning the nature of that meaning and that meaning can be personal that meaning can have a historical um can have a historical uh a level to it historical valence to it um but the the question is where how are you deploying that are you deploying it in a way that is positive in a way that actually unlocks things for people are you a, or are you deploying it in a way that is divisive um that actually that that creates misinformation that in fact leads to um division um that creates separation from the and that that that's i don't think that's nuance i think that it's subtle and maybe and maybe maybe i'm those are those are just too synonymous um but i don't think that's just saying well you're you're not you're not applying the same standards to x as you're applying to y when there's there is a subtle but meaningful distinction between them um and it's a it's important for how people are gaining their meaning about this stuff and then how they are using it to to connect with others 
So we're running out of time, Tad, but is there any final point Again? you'd like to share? Again. Yes, I know. It's been a great chat. Uh, but uh, um, is there any sort wow. of final reflections you have or any um, recommendations for anybody who might want to sort of think critically about this digital public history? Um, I, it, mine is to think critically about it, um, that, uh, that I think that the more that we are able to, you know, you and I have talked about creating kind of best practices and sort of seeing what we can do about it. But I think that in the end, what's great about uh, public scholarship, public archaeology and public history in the digital media space is that there, there are no gatekeepers. Um, is that it is the more the merrier come one come all um, and uh, as long as you are in a mindset to um, to be a part of a community um, to recognize that one of the, the greatest lessons that I was ever taught was that you're not there to be the smartest person in the room but to help everybody else to be as smart as they can possibly be that that to me is a is a community of of, of scholarship that digital media enables you to do and to be as be as bold and to be as creative um, as you possibly can, because none of this stuff is so precious that it can't be played with, um, that it can't be, and then there is nobody who is so exalted that they can't be questioned. That that is a part of the discussion. It's a part of the. Uh, it's a part of the the conversation. To me, um, the best part of public history, and particularly public history practice in digital media, um, isn't the presentation of of subjects. Um, it is the conversation that it then sparks, right. um, an ongoing dialogue that then creates, I firmly believe, creates new meaning. Um, if, uh, if I present something or if I respond to something and somebody asks me a question that I didn't consider that may, it requires me to kind of go back and think again about it and come back with a new response and reach for another source to make somebody else then come out and layer these kind of discussions, then that is part of seeing our engagement as an ongoing discussion, as an ongoing practice, not as, and this is something I, I don't like about what some people think about as history, is we are presenting final answers to anything. We are presenting the best of what we know right now. Um, this is the closest version of the truth that we have. I will share that with you. You give me your thoughts on that and let's get closer. Let's question that. Let's move forward with, uh, with, with our discussion and engagement. To me, to me, that's what's exciting about it and why I, in fact, look forward to opening TikTok. Um, sometimes I cringe a little bit when I notice that something of mine has a, a several thousand more views than it really should have had. I'm like, oh, my God, what did I do? Um, it does create uh, more but, problems than it's worth. Yeah, sometimes. you're like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> you can't predict got, it. Yeah, you're like, it's got 100 comments. No. Um, but what did I do wrong? Uh, but when you look at them and you're like, hey, this is – uh, this is sparking the kind of conversation that public history through digital media should represent. Um, and that is the value, right? If we are if public history, modern public history practice is telling stories about the past and the present that help us understand how we relate to one another or in moments of conflict, how we don't. Um, and in doing that in an authentic way, it helps us get to understand authentically what is possible next to make things better. Um, that is based upon an informed conversation, but an ongoing informed conversation in which there is no gatekeeper of authority who is just unilaterally presenting um, facts and ideas. It's about sparking um, engagement conversation and digital media, particularly through platforms like TikTok that, ena that, that enable that kind of creative engagement um, makes it, I think, the most exciting place to be practicing public history and public archaeology today. I think it's it's boisterous, yes. It is, uh, it is conditional, yes, um, but it also has the, the biggest high-end potential um, for or for anybody and so i think that it's only a force for good even as we're dealing with the challenges of what makes it not so good sometimes well dr stomer that's been absolutely fascinating thank you so much we've run out of time but um we could go on and on but yeah. we'll continue the conversation on tiktok yes but 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 um, we'll put a link in the description to all your social media that you wish <laughs> us to share um and but thank you so much it's been a pleasure and a privilege and and uh and uh we'll keep the chat going and i hope people are join in <laughs> thank you so much professor williams it's always a pleasure to talk to you for relaxing times make it archaeodesk time